So this is an introduction to jurisprudence and um, it will again go through the emotions of the introduction to jurisprudence as a level 6 module of the University of London but again jurisprudence as can be studied in other modules in other um, areas as well so this video may help so this is well the level 6 LA 3005 jurisprudence and it explores a lot of different areas of law of course um, while keeping in mind that it talks about theory and perspectives of um, different jurists of course on um, different perspectives on law right so the module covers several topics chapters as you may call them and some concepts and theories in jurisprudence so let's start okay so this slide again of course mentions the questions we'll be considering so the questions are what is jurisprudence and legal theory um, what is the module about how the exam or the assessment pattern has been set and how do you study and some sample questions and its answers all right so what is jurisprudence and legal theory um, this is going to be a very short um, slide because jurisprudence is a theory um, based subject so it's a study of theories and theories of laws and it seeks to understand the nature of law itself, the principles that underline um, the legal systems and the relationship between the law and society. Okay, so it's very important to understand that um, Juris is unlike the other subjects, like um, I, I can actually say like all the other subjects. So in rest of the modules and a lot of different subjects like contract and criminal and trust or property or even public law or public international law all of these subjects um take a lot of credit and t work a, a lot around several cases and a idea or a notion and that case and why that case is the way it is but juris is unlike them so what it talks about is mostly how a theory is or how an idea is for example that is how um a positivist idea is or how a feminist legal theory is so from a radical feminism to the modernized versions of feminism it'll consider all theories all concepts the notion so that perspective will be taken into account and with that perspective its history the social values it has the philosophical ideas people have put out because of that perspective and then compare them so that's how you understand um, jurisprudence and um, of course students do study these roles in society these theories these concepts because we have um, some of the concepts that we do come around in our daily lives are feminism and liberalism and such ideas are talked about in everyday life so it's not something that's so far-fetched or um, we don't even consider them right these are things that we talk about in our day-to-day -day life so then these questions and these series can also relate to um, power law morality or how the social hierarchy or how the social um, structure is you know literally structured around it 
And that is how people in society um, consider these theories. So when society may hold feminism or liberalism at a different standard and the other may hold it into a different standard, one may consider themselves to be a radical feminist and one may consider themselves to actually not be a feminist at all. So um, the relationship between law and then the relationship between the social standings as well um, needs to be understood in jurisprudence. Okay, so what is the module about? So the module has um, several, of course, discussions, several aspects, um, and it covers several theories. Some of the theories I've listed below, and we will consider these theories, and we'll talk about them, um, starting off with the natural law. So natural law theory and its relationship to morality and the idea of good life. So it bases around that idea um, and moreover natural law is a theory in ethics jurisprudence and political philosophy as well so it posits about the existence of a universal moral law right so that is um, discoverable through reason and applicable to all human beings like a standard um, it holds moral principles that they are inherent in the nature of the universe and can be known by reasons alone. So they are independent of particular religions and um, cultures. And natural law theory, um, according to natural law theory, these moral principles, they are based on human nature and the common good. This is really important. So it talks about common good a lot. And as they provide the basis uh, for evaluating human actions and institutions. So natural law is often the, um, it's contrasted with positive law, um, which is like the body of laws and regulations created by governments and other institutions, people per se. This, on the other hand, it talks about a universal moral code. And one of the key proponents of natural law um, theory was the ancient uh, Greek philosopher Aristotle. So, so that's kind of where the course begins, literally from Aristotle, um, who argued that there is a natural law purpose or end for everything in the universe, and that uh, human beings have a natural purpose as well. Later, uh, medieval philosophers like Thomas Aquinas um, developed the natural law theory further, emphasizing the importance of reason in discovering and understanding natural law. And in modern times, um, natural law theory has been influential in debates over human rights and social justice and the role of society. While there is some disagreement among natural law theorists about the specifics of the moral principles that make up natural law, the concept remains an important and widely debated idea in philosophy and politics. Next, let's talk about um, legal positivism. So this chapter examines the legal positivist perspective which see the law as a social phenomenon created and enforced by human beings, right? Um, that is, the legal positivism is a theory in which jurisprudence um, that holds that the validity of law is based on an authority of the state or the will of the people who create and enforce it. Rather than on moral or natural principles, legal positivists um, argue that the law is a social construct created and enforced by human beings rather than a manifestation of divine or natural law. So that's where the contrast comes. According to um, legal positivism, 
the law is whatever is created by the relevant legal authorities, such as legislative bodies, courts, or the executive branch. The law is not necessarily based on moral principles, although it may be influenced by them. Legal positivists believe that the law should be studied as a social phenomenon rather than an expression of morality or natural law. So, one of the key proponents of legal positivism in the 19th century was the philosopher John Austin. We'll talk a lot about Austin and Austin's theory about legal positivism, and as well as who argued that the law consists of rules laid down by a sovereign authority and enforced by sanctions. Now, this literally is one of um, the most talked about, I think, in the Jewish concept that what Austin talks about is a authority, the sovereign authority and the enforcing of um, laws by sanctions, right? Because Austin believed that there was no necessary connection between law and morality and that the authority of law was based solely on its ability to compel obedience. Uh, you can consider that in respect in several aspects of life. Legal positivism has been criticized by some philosophers and legal scholars who argue that it fails to account for the moral and ethical dimensions of law. Critics of legal positivism argue that there are moral principles that should inform the creation and enforcement of law, and then the law should be evaluated based on those um, principles and adherence to those principles. This is a really fun discussion and a question is always there on legal positivism in, on the exam paper. A very important topic to consider in studying. Next, let's talk about um, the FLT, that's Feminist Legal Theory. This chapter explores the feminist perspective on law and its focus on gender issues and the experience of women. So, feminism is a social and political movement that advocates for the rights, equality, and the empowerment of women. Feminism seeks to challenge and overcome the systematic oppression and discrimination faced by women and to create a society in which women have equal opportunities and are treated with dignity and respect. Feminism has its roots in the 19th and the early 20th century as women begin to organize and mobilize for greater rights and opportunities such as the right to vote, access to education, and equal pay for equal work. Equal pay still continues even though we have several um, work done, statutes passed, but nonetheless it seems an everlasting and inevitable concept. The movement has since expanded to encompass a wide range of issues, including reproductive rights, workplace discrimination, domestic violence, and the representation of women in media and politics. So feminism is based on the belief that gender should not be a basis for discrimination, and that women should have the same opportunities and rights as men. Feminists often seek to challenge traditional gender roles and stereotypes and to promote the idea that men and women are equal and deserving of respect and dignity. Feminism is a diverse and complex movement with different branches and perspectives. Some of the major schools of feminist thought include liberal feminism, radical feminism, intersectional feminism, and ecofeminism. While there is some disagreement among feminists about specific goals and strategies, the movement is united by a commitment to gender equality and the empowerment of women. Next, let's talk about... 
Next, let's talk about liberalism. So what is liberalism? We've heard this term too much lately, or maybe a lot on um, television political shows. What it is, is a political philosophy and a worldview that emphasizes individual liberty, equality, and the importance of free market and democracy. In short, liberalism is an idea. Okay, It emerged in the 17th and the 18th centuries as a response to the authoritarian monarchies and religious hierarchies of Europe. And its ideas have since spread throughout the world. At its core, liberalism holds that individuals should be free to pursue their own goals and interests as long as they do not harm others or infringe upon their rights, the other people's rights. This includes the right to free speech, freedom of religion and freedom of association. Liberals also believe in equality before the law and reject discrimination based on factors such as race, gender, or sexual orientation. In economic terms, liberalism advocates for a free market, free market system in which individuals and businesses are free to compete and innovate without undue government intervention or regulation. So, this is based on the belief that the market, when left to its own devices, will efficiently allo allocate um, resources and um, promote economic growth, right? So overall, you say that liberalism is a broad and complex political philosophy that encompasses a range of perspectives and beliefs, but it is united by a commitment to individual liberty, equality, and democratic governance. Last but certainly not the least is the Marxism. So what is Marxist and what is the Marxist theory? It's a political and economic philosophy that originated from the ideas of the German philosopher himself, Karl Marx. Marx believed that capitalism is a system that creates inequality and exploitation, and that the working class is oppressed by the capitalist class. According to Marxists, capitalism creates a class struggle between the bourgeoisie, that is the capitalist class, the elite, and the proletariat, the working class. So the bourgeoisie owns the mean of production, such as factories and machines while the pro proletariat owns only their labor, so which they sell to the bourgeoisie in exchange for wages, monetary compensation. Marx argued that the bourgeoisie extracts surplus value from the labor of proletariat, leading to exploitation and alienation. Marxism advocates for the establishment of a classless society in which the means of production are owned collectively by the workers themselves. This would be achieved through a revolution in which the working class seizes the political power and creates a socialist state. In the socialist state, the means of production are owned and controlled by the workers and resources are distributed according to need. So Marxism also includes a critique of cultural and ideological systems, arguing that they serve to perpetuate the dominance of the ruling class, the elite. This includes religion, education, and the media, which are seen as tools of the ruling class to maintain their power. Overall, Marxism is a complex and multifaceted um, philosophy that has had a significant impact on political and social movements around the world. And yes, Marxism has had a resurface. So in the paper, in examination, a question definitely would come for Marxism. And it also would talk about maybe the 
the 21st century Marxism, um, how it has resurfaced and how is it relevant today. So shortly we'll talk about what is the assessment or the exam pattern that is for the 2023 um, May, June and the 2023 um, October pattern for exam. So um, this is an unseen examination. It will be split into two parts. So part A is a you uh, it's a compulsory part of course but there are three questions so you have to choose um one question to do from part a so one of the three and in part b you have a choice out of nine questions you have to do three questions in part B but remember the one question that you do from part A it has um, it cannot overlap in theme with the questions that you choose from part B so you'll have one two three questions in part A then you'll have four to six questions in part B which will have the same theme as one to three in that same order so if you choose for example the question two so you will not be able to attempt the question four in part b that is if you choose to attempt a question on marxism for example in part a you will not be allowed to or uh, your answer will not be countered um, if you choose to attempt a question on Marxism in part B. So be careful about that. Um, considering part A, we'll talk about it more as you'll be required to study a case. And for this year, the 2023, um, you have the Supreme Court case of Lloyd and Google as the 2021. Um, which you can of course find on the internet or uh, online available resources if you can't find it just comment below and i'll send you the link whatever i can find or i'll create a dropbox or a drive box or something and you can look um over there so um as the party case um changes every year and so do the themes that relate to part A. So this year, as you know, that you have Lloyd and Google 2021. Um, the three themes that you have are liberalism and law, Dawkins theory, and the feminist legal theory. So one of the three you have to attempt. So you can choose one of the three themes. Next, um, in part B, as we've already discussed, you have a choice of nine essay questions. You will not be permitted to attempt a overlapping theme uh, in part B, but you can attempt any of the other questions. And then that is uh, attempting three questions in part B and one question in part A. That is four questions in total to complete your paper. So. The papers, though, are um, four questions total. Um, the time is going to be four hours and 15 minutes. But please do uh, confirm it because you have to do your part, due diligence. OK? OK, so as by now, we've understood that um, jurisprudence is a theory based subject and more so it's connected to theories and jurists and um day-to-day -day life and everything so um it's a bit different than studying a contract or a criminal subject right because you're not going to be making a case list you're not going to be studying a lot of different cases and then 
um, writing your answers. So your answers need to be um, relevant. Your answers need to talk about theory in detail. For part A, it's um, very simple. You need to firstly study the judgment that's Lloyd and Google, LLC 2021. Um, then for part B, there is a uh, recommended, a mandatory, I'd say as well, um, reading that is the concept of law by heart. Because for students who wish to attempt hard, and even for students who wish to understand Juris, um, it is better that you read this book to write an informative answer regarding Hart and his interactions with other Jews as well. Um, because sometimes on the paper there are two questions involving Hart, right? Literally two questions, and they have one is all about Hart, and the other is. Um, with some other Jewish, so it's better that you know what you're talking about. So firstly, you need to like read the entire case, um, what the case is about, then identify the relevant um, significance uh, and uh, applicability um, of the general theories of law in the real life context of legal practice. This is for um, the part A. Because there can be any question on the three perspectives that have been given. So you need to like prepare and reflect on the um, legal theory according to the judgment, right? It is important to know that you will not be required to discuss the doctrine, um, legal aspects of the case, or no prior knowledge of the area of law involved in the case is expected, right? So that's there. Um, just for like a quick um, guidance, I think I'll just say that for liberalism, you can read the chapter 12, the module, uh, module guide. So... Some of the questions should be like, uh, you can concentrate on them. So these would be, how does the said case relate to justice theories? Or does it tell us about anything about uh, the relationship between law and morality? Right? Um, the next theme is Dorkins, right? So for this, you should prepare from chapter 9 of the module guide. So Dorkins' argument regarding what judges do in hard cases. Um, especially his critique of Hart's positivism and his analysis of principles, policies, and rules. Some of the questions on which um, to focus can be how can principles determine judicial de decisions? How are principles grounded in law? How ought they to be grounded? Um, is the decision taking into account policies or principles? Right? How do Dworkin's concept of fit, integrity, discretion, one right answer relate to the judgment, if at all? Then the third theme, uh, the third theme is the FLT, that's Feminist Legal Theory, and you can turn to Chapter 12 of your module guide um, to see um, FLT as well. Um, so some questions to consider would be in what ways would FLT analyze the set case or how does it highlight uh, issues of gender if at all so that is there so and for um, section B read the module guide uh, for part B, read the module guide, the extra readings to prepare for each theory that comes. Uh, for example, for legal positivism, firstly, like reading the positivism from the guide and then simultaneously also noting down all the legal positivists involved in legal positivism, right? And then at the end, considering their perspective in light of several different questions raised and then answering them accordingly and then, um, you know, critiquing all the jurists involved. So that can be a way, a different way to study um, jurists um, than the other subjects.
Okay, so for a simple question and a answer for the simple question, I will be considering heart because heart is there in every single paper. So a journal overview would be nice. Um, so the question is, we will know everything we need to know about the central case of law. Once we have graphs that develop legal systems consist of the union of primary and secondary rules. Discuss. So this is a 2015 Zone B papers question, um, and the question uh, and the question would have uh, a journal remark or the content that requires that the question requires is. Um, First, that you need to outline what Hart's account of fully developed legal system in terms of the union of primary and secondary rules is. Then second, and very importantly, the question calls for a critical discussion of this thesis, right? So at the end, it says discuss. Um, a key phrase here is um, central case. So what are the central cases of concepts, right? What general features must the central case of the concept of law have? Does the description of law as the union of primary and secondary rules meet these requirements or must it be replaced or contemplated by something further? To tackle these issues, you would of course need to refer to the um, relevant material that is and the most relevant material i think for this one is again um the concept of law um by Hart, and also a lot of criticisms that Hart has received by theorists such as dorkin and finnis so your question of, of course would go something like um first that you talk about the legal systems and everything and then you also go into critics right okay so that's what um the content was now we talk about orientation that is how do you you know produce it how do you write it down um you need to really keep in mind that in these questions you need to clearly state whether you agree with the question or you disagree with the questions. And of course, just not like agree with this blah, blah question or disagree with this blah, blah question and the statement or whatever. You have to give reasons. Um, giving reasons is important because it is a typical for like candidates to say in the exam that they agree or disagree with something, some proposition. But um, saying why is the actual um gist of it the premise of it so in a courtroom you'd be say okay i'm the lawyer and i disagree with this or i agree with this or my um client is innocent or my client is guilty or of course you're not going to say my client is guilty but you're going to say that my client is innocent but you will be giving reasons why you think that your client is innocent so that's the inherent motive that why do you think um so you need to emphasize, so you need to talk about um, what Hart means when he talks about, like, his theory. So critic of Hart emphasize um, that law is first and foremost a normative order, right? That is, it tells us what we ought to do. Accepting this, which Hart does, has one very important upshot. In order to capture law's nature, one would have to account for law's normativity. And that, that is, i.e., law's ability to guide our actions. Thinking of the central case of law in terms of the union of primary and secondary rules does not provide a deeper account of law's normativity. Critics would also insist that the source of normativity is unitary. Therefore, if there is any distinction between legal and moral ob obligation, it is purely contingent. Law and morality are on a continuum. Uh, 
it follows that the central case of law would have to include the reason for which law is valuable and for which we are under an obligation to follow it. So you keep on talking about um, how critical you can be of heart and why do you think that there are um, loopholes in what he says and what he talks about. Okay, and moreover, like the arguments point in like different directions. So Hart's arguments may be preferred because um, they are more reconcilable with our institution about law than the objections, right? When talking about law, at least in certain contexts, we do refer to institutions of law, the existence of which is neatly captured by the union of primary and secondary rules idea, right? Nevertheless, a caveat is necessary. This um, conception of law does not tell us everything we need to know about law. In order to develop a deeper understanding of law, we need an account of what makes it normative. Um, if the neutrality thesis is to be maintained, further argument is required to be complement of uh, the union of rules ideas. So you'll have paragraphs on discussions on some of the aspects that are given in the question, and that's the kind of orientation that you'll um, pick um, like bit by bit you talk about what the question is asking right and lastly the structure of the answer is that um, first you have the opening paragraph or a set of paragraphs sometimes there are some people who write um, two to three opening paragraphs and there is just like a simple um, structure as well that you start with just one opening paragraph um, which should have an impact though this sets out what you're going to do clearly and succinctly and get straight to it right so as in the above argument on the central case of law the center section should contain argument backing up your views so you can share your own views and um, reasons as well and then the point is that you must back up the theory, the whatever that you're presenting, agreeing or disagreeing, with um, proper arguments, right? Regarding the idea that you're talking. Then a summing up in which you draw your conclusion. This should not be a repetition of a, but a neat summary of your view not a repetition of your view. So the summary shows that your answer forms an argument in which you have set out to do something and you've done it, now you're just like um, closing it, right? Um, it is also important to consider that you can use um, real life illustration and examples, but um, ones which you can put forward in your answers with um, legal backing. S something like um, a in a feminist answer or something, that would be the Me Too movement, or in a liberal answer, it could be the Black Lives Matter. But um, of course, these series, these um, movements have legal backing, right? So not something that is very random, but something that uh, makes sense to the question asked. So thank you for your time. And I hope this was a informative uh, video. I hope this helps and kindly share, kindly like, and kindly subscribe to the channel. Um, yeah, so if there are any questions, um, any further questions do comment them below and I will definitely try to get back to you. Thank you